King, the Lord of Lords. We exalt you. We lift you high, God. It's only by you, God, that we can do any of this, God, in the name of Jesus. So we pray today, God, that there be a shifting in the atmosphere, God, that there be a breakthrough, God, that all chains be broken, God, all bondage be broken, God, in the name of Jesus, God, that we seek you, Lord. Let us seek your faith, God. Thank you. 
We cannot go into another season the same way we walked in from the last one. You're wanting new harvest, new, se new seasons. You want everything new, but you can't walk into it doing the same old, same old. So I encourage you, find a place at this altar and get ready to lay down a sacrifice of praise because it's going to cost you something. But I tell you what, it's worth the price. It's worth what you lay down. It's worth the oil. It's worth the tears. It's worth the cries. It's worth your shout. God is saying to go to another level. It's going to cost you so you cannot go in the same way you used to be. God is saying year five can't look exactly like year six. So I say to you right now, in the name of Jesus, God is rising up warriors who are leaving past armor behind and putting on the full armor of God. They're leaving behind old wine skins and God is giving them new ones. And God is getting ready to pour out the oil and pour out the wine. God, in the name of Jesus, consecrate us and set us apart in the name of Jesus. Find a place, even if you got a fit, sit at the front row, fine. Sit at the front row. But I encourage you, you need to do a self-reflection. Can I go into next year? Can I go into this new year? The same person I was last. You've been battling anger and frustration within yourselves, even within the church, and you're wondering why you can't grow past it. It's because you're trying to go into another season with the same old wine skins. So we say right now, God, let the King of Heaven have His way. Let the King of Heaven have His way. Let the King of Heaven have His way. Come on. Let the King of Heaven have His way. Let the King of Heaven have His way. Let the King of Heaven have His way. Come on. You come on, sir. Come on. King of Come on. Come on. Somebody shoot. Look at your voice. King of Kings, have your way. A divine intervention, a divine interruption. Right here, right now. If the word of the Lord tells you to stay in a course, you stay there. Because God says, I want you to dwell where I am. Not with the way the way things go. Not because of a song list. God is saying, I'm taking you to a higher level. Because you are no longer a person that just goes off of a song list. You are going after God's own face. You are going after God's own presence. You are going after and saying, I will lead you there. I will take you there. So Father God, release a greater anointing in this house. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done. Have your way, God. Have your way, God. your kingdom go miracles in his name signs and wonders in his name jesus jesus come on come on lift up your voices in prayer lift up your voices in prayer Jesus, 
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus, come on, Jesus, 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 Omega, beginning, in the end, Holy One, Mighty One. your spirit high, Lord God. I oh, thank you, Father God. Oh, Shedabakasha. Coming this year, it's going to be different, church. Hallelujah. We're not going to go out. We're not going to come in the same way. Hallelujah. Things from the past are in the past. But we want something new. I know I do. I want more. Oh, come on. I want more from you, God. Oh, Rabakasha, but that's going to take me and everybody else in here to lay it down, to lay the past down, right? We're not going to go into a new year the same way like Pastor Jeremy said. Hallelujah. So that's going to mean sacrifice. Oh, Rabakasha. Oh, shit, Rabakasha. I thank God for Crossway. Oh, that we go into a new season for a new reason. Hallelujah. That revival continue. That revival continue in this place. Oh, Shadabaka. That doesn't just mean this here, the church. That means right here in our hearts. Come on. You got to want it. You got to want something new. Oh, come on. I feel it stirring. Come on. Stir it up, Lord. What a Makasha. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Release 
church oh the spirit of the lord is upon us oh yeah can you feel it yes lord oh in the name of jesus come on lift up your voices thankful for today. So long to my old friends 
burden and bitterness. You can just keep it moving. No, you ain't welcome here. From now till I walk the streets of gold, I think of how you saved my soul. His way were turning, and found his way back. Oh, 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 oh. He picked me up, he turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. I think the master, I think the savior, because he healed my heart, he changed my name. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. 
Oh, he is worthy to be praised. Come on. Oh, Shadabakasha. We thank you, Lord. God, give us strength. Morabakasha. So this song starts out with all the saints and angels. Who are all my saints and angels here? Come on. We're all saints and angels of God. So we got to worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. All right, come on. Sun, to the rising of the 
can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make us whole again nothing but the blood of sing it again sing it again what can wash away what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus. what can make me whole again what can make Precious is that so no other founds I know. Come on. Lift up the name. Just lift up your voice. I wanna be where the glory comes out. I wanna be where the glory comes out. Oh come on. Put me under the spout where the glory comes out. Because there is no other fount I know. There is no other fount I know. Jesus! Jesus! There is no other name. Which you can be saved. It's at the name of Jesus. Demons tremble. It's at the name of Jesus. Come on. Begin to lift up that name. He said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So we lift up your name. 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 Jesus. 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 What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name. What a wonderful name it is, and nothing compares to this. Jesus. With every hand lifted, Father God, we come before your presence, O Lord. Oh, I tremble. Our heart is to be revived again, God. Would you not revive again your people, oh Father God? Would you not revive us again, oh God? God, can you not bring back life to dry bones? Lord, only you know. Lord, only you know. Lord, only you know. So we pray and we speak to the dry bones of the valley, oh God. Come back to life. We speak a word, God, that says, God, my children are coming back to life. My home is coming back to life. My marriage is coming back to life. Just pray for one more minute, I promise. Just come on. Stay with me there. Focus. Meditate. Jesus. I do not want to be the same person I walked in as. I do not want to be the same person I walked in as, oh Lord. I need you more than ever.
Come on, can you just give him praise this morning? Can you just honor the name of Jesus? We're going to sing that one more time. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. Let that be your prayer. From you are I give you everything. I give you everything. I give you everything. I don't know what you've been going through. I don't know the pain that you've been experiencing. Only God knows, but I can tell you this. Through all the pain and through all the hurt, even the doubt and the church hurt that you've gone through, God is saying to you, that wasn't me, that was man. And God is saying to you right now, you need to come up and ask God for forgiveness. I don't know what you're, I don't know the heaviness you've been carrying, but you've been carrying it for a very long time. And even God is telling you now, forgive that you might be forgiven. Forgive that you, you've been holding on to something for a very long time. They don't deserve forgiveness, you say. They don't deserve your forgiveness. They don't even deserve me talking to them. But God is saying it's not for them, it's for you. Because you've been carrying the hurt for too long and God is telling you, let it go. Even now you feel me talking to you and you feel like I'm talking directly to you. Yes, that's the Holy Spirit talking to you, not me. God is talking to you right now. I don't know what he did to you. I don't know what he said to you. But God is saying you need to let it go right now. It's been a very long time. See, man will abandon you, but God won't. Man will turn his back on you. God won't. I have never left you, never forsaken you. Even to the end of time, I'm always with you. It is us who turn our back on. He wasn't lost. I was lost. We walk in lost and broken, wondering how are we ever going to get healed? Well, how am I ever going to deal with my past? But God is saying, you're trying to deal with something that you weren't meant to. The Bible says, cast all your cares unto the Lord, for he cares for you. If you want to let go of the past, the first thing you got to do is give it to God. God free me of my past. Okay, first you got to give it to him. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know the pain. I don't, I don't, but I know there's a heaviness right now in this room of someone battling the nightmares of their past. And God is telling you right now for you to go into a new season, you can't take in your old wines. You can't take in the, the, the thoughts of the past or who you used to be. It doesn't matter who you used to be. It's who God called you to be. God didn't call you to be YouTube famous or Insta famous or Facebook. God didn't call you for that. He's not looking for influencers. He's looking for those who he can influence by the Holy Spirit, who I can use, who I can speak to for such a time as this. Every hand lifted. Father God, here I am, Lord. Send me. Here I am, Lord. Send me. I know that we still serve a God of miracles. Yeah, that's right. I know I've seen it. Yeah, and I've seen it time and time again yeah. in this house. Not in some other. I've seen it in this house. Yeah. Right where you're at. We're going to start believing the miracle in this house. Watch. Yeah. Pastor Chris, can you bring up Brother Zeke real quick? Hallelujah. Time and time again, the enemy has tried to give you false report after false report, lie after lie, false diagnosis after false diagnosis. Well, it could be true to them, but who, whose report shall you believe? I shall believe the report of the Lord. I don't believe the darkness of the enemy. I don't believe the darkness of the situation around me. I don't look at the situation around me. You know why? Because I've seen the situations turn around overnight. I've seen sicknesses dry up overnight. I've seen cancers dry up within moments. And that, that's not even a lie. I can say that right now. 
they tell you that your, your cell count is off, that your liver or your, your kidneys are bad. I do not stand upon the very foundation of what this world has. I know what I have seen. God, I know of your mighty works. I've seen your mighty hand move. Will you not do it again, oh God? God, right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, I speak to kidney. I speak to cell. I speak to, I say in the name of Jesus, we are going to get a report when they go back and do another test tomorrow. They're going to say, you know what? We were wrong. How is that possible? We can say it was only by God because they gave you a debt. They, they, you were in a coma. They told you to put your, your paperwork together that you were going to die. And that very night, God woke you up. Be can he not do it again? So I pray right now. Healing in Jesus' name. We come into agreement and say, God, let it be so. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before you're seated, why don't you greet your neighbor and say, I'm so glad. You made it here. Jesus. Your goodness overwhelms me. Satisfies my soul. You fill me. To overflowing, Lord, you're beautiful, Lord, you're beautiful. As the ushers prepare themselves, let them continue to pray. Let them pray. As we prepare to give our hearts to God. Again, everything we do... Every bit of it goes to help those who are on the streets. Those who go help the, the, we help them feed the homeless. We go help the hungry. We do everything we possibly can to financially help. So everything that is sown is for the kingdom of God. Father God, as we sow into the kingdom, souls will be reached. Lives will be restored in your mighty name. God, the word of God says what we sow, we shall, sow, we shall reap. So as I sow for souls to be reaped, God, souls in my life, family members in my life will be reaped in Jesus' mighty name. Go ahead, ushers. Go ahead. Overflowing, Lord. You're beautiful. that you stretch your hands this way. Heavenly Father, for the word that is about to go forth, I ask God that the anointing of the Holy Spirit be upon me to set the captives free, to preach healing to the broken, revival to the dead. God, let every word spoken be from the very throne room of heaven to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Someone give God a shout of praise. Amen. Come on now. Thank you, worship team. I want to, I want to, my own little praise report. People have been asking, well, I thought we have only been doing this for five years. Well, yes, we closed out. This is our fifth anniversary, closing out five years. From 2019 to 2020 was our very first year. And I'm not going to lie, that was a very hard year. We started with a very few amount of us that are here now. And when I read the word of God, one represents oneness.
being unified with God, creation. On the first day, God created. And when I first remember when we first started, we were, it was really hard because it was like, well, what do we do? You know, where, where do we go from here? It's, it's like, and God would say, well, the only best way to go is up. When you feel like you've hit rock bottom, the best way is up. Well, and then the second year came along and things started working beautifully. 2019 was a, a good year. And all of a sudden, we had services where it was jam-packed in here. And we were unified. And then COVID-19 happened. And God said, so stay in unity. Stay together. Stay, keep going. Doesn't matter. Keep going. So we never closed the church. We kept the doors open. We spaced out the chairs a little bit, but we kept going. There were services where literally it was the worship team and a camera and a few others. But God says, stay unified. Stay together. Have I not brought you? Have I not called you to be bold and courageous? Have I brought you got together for a reason? That was our second year. As it closed out in 2021, as we were finally... Everyone said, I wanted to see normal again. And I, and I said, I don't want to see normal. God's not bringing back normal. God's bringing revival. And God's bringing back something powerful. And he's going to close up something. And he's going to break And he's going to strengthen something. In 2021, in our third year, we saw an outbreak of revival in this place that I cannot even explain. As we went into a fourth year. We started seeing the winds come in and that the Holy Spirit begin to move. And in the fifth year, we saw a lot of God's grace and God gave us power to do things that we never thought we could do. We went out and started hitting the streets even harder. We started going out preaching the gospel even more. People went out to listen, and, and God started moving in a powerful way. The people that children saw. Last year was one of our strongest cancer. We saw children praying for adults at the altar of God, and we didn't, we couldn't, ex, we couldn't, you could not even explain it. So as we, today, we close out five going into six, God was speaking a word on me. Well, where, where do we go from here? Do we, do we know what, is, what, what happens now? And I kept on asking God, what, what do we need the most? We need grace, most of all, because I can't do it without you. I can't do it without your strength. Grace is God's strength upon your life to do the things that you never thought you could do. But we need to have growth in our lives, not just for our own, for our, some of us, I guess, <laughs> my dad used to say it, some of us are too busy growing in the lard and not growing in the Lord. <laughs> we, grow, we grow this temple, but we never grow the actual the spiritual and the things of God. We like to grow. We like, you know, we're so comfortable, you know, fellowshipping, but we never fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Right. We're too scared to chase, to, 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 to chase down and kill the giants because we like the comfortableness. But you need to understand that we're going on a higher level of grace and glory with God. God has taken us to higher heights. But the only way to do that is you're going to have to realize that you're going to have to leave yesterday's seasons behind. You can't go. Some of you are just like, you know what? I, I talked to some people that lived in high school. And I, I, and I was like, well, I graduated in 2001. That was, oof, lot, it was a long time ago. I graduated a long time ago. We'll just say that. I graduated high school a long time ago, and I talked to some old high school friends that are still talking about playing football in high school. I'm like, cool, did you ever play uh, co uh, college football? No. But they talk about games like it was yesterday. I'm like, dude, you, you know that was like 23 years ago, right? But they're caught up in the yesterday. They're caught up in the past. They caught, some people still talk about being a non-Christian in their Christian life, missing the old days. Oh, I remember I used to make money back in the day. Oh, I used to walk this way. I used to, people used to know who I, they used to put some respect on my name. I don't care about that because who I used to be used to go to darkness. Who I used to be was dying. Who I used to be was in destruction. Who I used to be was in the depression and anxiety and frustration. I used to be a very anxious person and I used to 
envy a person caught up in depression so much that I was the thought I, I, life was over. I don't ever want to go back because the person I used to be is not who I was called to be. The person I used to be was called to death. The person I'm called to be is the person called to life. So the scriptures I'm going to give you today, they're going to be a little, not all over the place, but it'll be give you an understanding where we're headed. You see, here at Crossway, the vision is that we're saved by grace to seek his face, to love the lost and revival at all costs. Not many people know that. Not many people really see that. They've seen it on the Facebook. They've seen it on certain posts, but they don't really, what does that mean? What does it mean to be saved by grace? What does it mean to, to seek God's faith? What, yeah, and, they, and they never know that, that lifestyle. What does it mean to really love the lost? What does it really mean when, I, when you say revival at cost, at all costs? What does that mean? So I hope you brought notes. I hope you brought, at least take screenshots. Go with me to John chapter 2. Go to John chapter 2 verse 1. Now on the third day there was a wedding at Cana. In Galilee, Jesus, the, uh, Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. I need you guys to remember something when I talked about the Galilean wedding, okay? When the wine ran out. Remember the cup of wine when we talked about the Galilean wedding? What was it? The, wine, the cup of joy. Some of y'all are living a life where you feel like your joy has run out. I don't have joy in my home anymore. I don't have joy in my marriage anymore. I don't have joy with my children. I don't have joy in my job anymore. He said, when the joy ran out, Jesus' mother said to them, they have no wine left. You see, when you run out of joy, other people will notice you ran out of it. Are you okay? Are you doing all right? The people will begin to worry about you. No, I'm good. You put on your mask. No, I'm all right. I'm good. I'm blessed. Not stressed. Highly favored. Jesus replied, and man, if I replied like this, I would have probably got, I would have been just color right off of me. Woman, why are you saying this to me? My time has not come yet. His mother told the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Now, there were six stone water jars there for a Jewish ceremonial washing. I want you to remember that part. The stone jars were there for ceremonial washing. What would happen is... During a wedding, it was a ceremonial thing. It was a ritualistic thing. What they would do is it was to become ritualistically clean. They would come into the father's house, and they would have these jars of water there for them to wash their hands and to wash their feet. You are now ritualistically clean to sit at my table. You came before God and asked God to ritualistically clean you. Hold on to that, okay? We'll come back. Jewish ceremonial washing, each holding 20, what did I say? I'm totally just up to head 20 or 30 gallons, okay? So each holding 20 or 30 gallons, okay? If you can do the math, that means there were six stone jars there. Six times 20, 120, or 130. So it means 130 gallon, uh, gallon, being able to hold it. Jesus told the servants, fill the water jars with water. So they filled them up even to the top. Now, he thought, what are they going to do? Are they going to give them water? What are they going to do? What are they going to do? It just makes no sense. We need wine. You're asking for water in a ceremonial jar. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it. Oh, sorry, sorry. Jesus told the servants to fill the water so they filled them up to the very top. Then he told them, draw some out and take it to the head steward. And they did. When the head steward tasted the water that had been turned into wine, not knowing where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, he called the bridegroom. He said, everyone serves the good wine first and then the cheaper wine when the guests are drunk. You have kept the good until now. Jesus did this as a first miraculous sign in Cana in Galilee. In this way, he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed him. He didn't say that the wedding believed him. Those who followed him believed him. Not everyone was going to believe him. Not everyone's going to know about it, but his disciples did. The disciples knew exactly what, what, God ha what had happened. 
as we read the scripture, we tend to begin to understand a little bit more about what it means to be saved by grace. The six water pots of Cana represent this. And if in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9, we're reminded that it is by grace we are saved through faith. That it is not from ourselves. It is a gift from God. It is not from works so that no one can boast. You can't go around saying, well, I did this so I could get saved. Well, I did this. Because, or, you know what? And I've heard pastors who preach, well, they're, they're saved because of me. No, they're saved because of Jesus. I, I, I can say this right now. Not a single person in here is saved because of me because I can't do nothing for you. I can't save you. I can't heal you. I can't do miracles. But I know a man from Galilee who can. I know one whose nail-scarred hands still touch to the, to the broken and they are healed. Not one word can I give you of my own accord will save you. But every time I preach the word of God, straight from the word of God, people are transformed. Why? Because it's only by the power of God. Amen. I can't do nothing. So that's when I tell you, stop looking to Facebook followers to save you. Stop looking at Facebook influencers. People are so caught up on influencers and influencers and people who influence this and people who are Insta famous and YouTube famous. And now look what they've become. Look what they've become. Look what happened to them. Why? Because they were so interested in the likes instead of being like Jesus. Like the water in those stone jars which served for ceremonial washing and represented the old ways of purification. That was the old way. So those jars represented the old way of being cleansed. It represented the old way of being washed. Y'all remember, they used to say, well, you just, you just need a come to Jesus kind of moment. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Because some people don't realize, they think it's just, if I just go to church, I'll be fine. If I just go to the church house, I'll be okay. If I just sit there with nobody watching and nobody looking at me and not even say a thing, I'll be just fine. But I can tell you right now that church attendance does not equal salvation. It's when you come into contact with Jesus, when you have a real encounter with it. And I'm not talking about this fake so-called, you know, Jesus is my kind of this mentality that people just, they, they put up a fake Jesus and then, well, he just assumes that everyone's okay. No, he came that there might be separate, that there's, I'm going to separate the, tea, the, the, the wheat from the tares. I'm going to separate. There is a separation that needs to happen. You need to understand that, yes, he gets me, but I'm never the same again. They've used that, 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 that slogan as a way of saying, you know what? You can still live the same way you want to. You can still live that same lifestyle, uh, but we should be affirming. No, because he said, uh-uh, I came that you might have life. But if you keep on living that lifestyle, it leads unto death. Because why? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of Christ is eternal life. I can't, I, I mean, I, I will love the hurting. I will love the broken. If they are hurting and they need something, I will be there to help them. But I cannot affirm that because the word of God tells me that. But you are just being a bigot. No, I'm not. You confuse that. You've confused being offended with being convicted. And we lost our conviction now. Where no one wants to stand upon the word of God because what? It's just too hard. You're right. Because it was called to set you apart. It was called to, called to be different. Man, my goodness, I was talking with my wife. For those of you, and I think everybody here knows Diana. Little, a <laughs> lot lower than that, somewhere in there. Well, yeah, she's, she, she, she may be tiny, but she's strong, man. That's like dynamite right there. But she's, I was talking with her, and I was talking, and we were talking about the kids, and I was talking to another friend of mine. How is it, and I feel sad, that to be a Christian it's hard. You know it's even harder to be a white Christian? Because they call it uh, Christian supremacy, or what is it called? Uh, Christian nationalists. Christian nationalists where they think, well, you're just, you're just, it's a white, you need to understand, it's never been a white Jesus. It was never, it's not a Jesus just for the white man. It's not a Jesus just for the, for the, the no, not for, no, it was a Jesus for all. He came for all. He came to, the, see, those people at that wedding, it was not just certain, it was all who were there. He said, you know, I came that all might have life. We can't get this mentality where, well, it's just, ju Jesus is just for the Christian. No, Jesus is for those who are hurting. But every time Jesus came to somebody, he were never the same person ever again. The woman at the, w at the well was never the same. Go and sin no more. Every time he sat down, well, Jesus sat down with prostitutes. Yeah, but they were never that same way again. 
Well, Jesus sat down with junkers. Yeah, but they never touched it again. Well, Jesus sat down with tax collectors. Yeah, and they left that lifestyle and never went back to it again. You see, every time you have a real encounter with Jesus, you're never the same again. Some of y'all can say, I'm not the same person who I used to be. That when I encountered God and when I encountered God's grace, I was truly saved. I'm not that same person anymore. And it's okay to say that. And it's all right to tell people that God can change you and God can restore you. I've seen miracles happen when God's grace touches someone and someone has a real encounter. You see, old ritualistic ways is not going to cleanse you. Old ritualistic ways, well, if I just go and I say the sinner's prayer and I, and I just go do it over and over again. I have an uncle. Pastor Anthony, even though we've said it before, man, that man must have been saved like seven times. And then I came up to the realization, you know what? That means, was he really saved the first? Was he really touched by God the first? Did he really change his life the first time? Because every time he really, he was more remorseful than repentant. He was sorry he got caught. He was sorry he was in the situation. His wife went through so many different things, but he was only sorry at those moments when they had to battle those moments. God is saying, if you were to truly repent and give your life to me, give everything you got, watch what happens. I will turn your life around for the better. Do you understand that these old stone pots was the old ways? Our lives are transformed into something extraordinary now. We are filled with a new wine of the spirit, which is a signifying joy, celebrating the, and, and a new covenant with Christ. God is saying, I'm not going to do it the old way you used to have it. I'm not going to be the, the old time. Old time. I'm going to do something powerful. I'm going to do something amazing in your life. You need to understand the abundance of the wine, the abundance of joy at the wedding. There was somewhere between 120 to 180 gallons of now something mighty and powerful. When God, oh, I'm talking to somebody. That was not just a little bit of a thing. God reminds us, behold, I am doing something new in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19. It says, behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I will make way where it doesn't seem like there is a way. I can change you when no one is saying you can ever change. I can bring you out of drug addiction. I can bring you out of falsehoods. I can bring you out of lies. I can bring you out of doubt. I'm going to do it in a way that you and I, well, pastor, I've been prayed for before. Well, pastor, I've gone to the altar before. Yes, but that was an old way. And I'll tell you, stop thinking about the old way. I'm going to do something so different in your life. You're going to be radically changed. You need to understand that God's provision in our lives through grace is not just sufficient, it's abundant. It's overflowing. And it's designed to meet every need with plenty left over. You see, he, he could have just done one pot and he goes, okay, there's, there's enough just to get you by. He filled six. I don't know about you, but I've, I've held a gallon of milk before. That's heavy. And there was 20 of those in those pots, 20 to 30 of those. God doesn't just provide joy that's just for enough for the day. God says, I'm going to provide you with enough until I come back. I'm going to provide enough for you to get through not just this week, not just this month, not just this year. I'm going to provide enough that you're going to be overflowing. What God doesn't just give you, he has exceedingly above and beyond more than enough. You see, the wine in Cana introduces a new covenant. It symbolizes the blood of Christ, the covenant not written in, on stone, but on the tablets of our heart. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 tells us not to conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind through grace. We embrace this new life where old things have passed away and all things have become new. I don't know the hurt and pains you've gone through, but God knows. And he says, you want to get rid of the old, then you've got to embrace what God has. You've got to let go of the old. Because all you're going to be doing is you're stuck in the old. Well, I'm, I'm, well I just, the way things used to be. We have, we've had people come in throughout the years. So this is how we used to do it in our old church. This is how we used to do it before. This is how, my, that's awesome. I'm great. 
how did it work that you are now here? I mean, I'm just saying, Pastor, don't you know you guys are just a little bit too loud? Pastor, don't you know that you're just a little bit too, too crazy? Come on, Ashley, come on now. I, I'm going to use I'm going to use that testimony for until it burns out because you know what she came in saying y'all are just nuts this place is I don't know what's going on here <laughs> Shane <laughs> no, this place is just crazy you see them jumping <laughs> I'm pretty sure Pastor Lewis is the one that scared them first with all the oil <laughs> it's like what am I trying to cook something But it's always scary at first, but once you jump into the river, man, that water's nice. Once you jump into the river of God and say, you know what, let's do this. I don't know about you, but you've ever jump up here at the, at, during worship, just get up here during worship, and you just let God move? Man, does it feel like, I'm going to do it. I don't care how religious you all get. He's wearing a T-shirt. So what? Don't let it fold. I got that at Goodwill. <laughs> I'm playing. You guys okay? Yeah, this doesn't bother you, right? I'm okay. I'm just letting you know right now. If it bothers you guys online, just put it in the comments. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Again, God works in such a way. It's, it's not the way you expect it. Sometimes, oh, I'm going to talk to somebody right now. Some of y'all are expecting a pastor that is just he wears a suit and a tie, and you're expecting someone to reach out to you who's just holier than thou. It looks like they're dressed up and ready to be in the matrix, and they're all just like completely, oh, look at that. That's a man of God. And like, oh, no. But then all of a sudden, God brings to you who's someone who's got sleeves all down their arms, who's got tracks from one day. They used to be a heroin addict. Oh, they're missing teeth because they used to be stuck on meth. But God is using a new generation of people that say, I don't care what you look like. I care what's on the inside. I don't care what you sound like because I'm going to bring something out of you. My grace is going to save you. My grace is going to change you. Grace is sufficient enough for you. I don't care what your past was because neither does God. And God is saying, get ready, honey boo boo. Put on your seatbelt and fasten up because we're about to take a ride that you've never been on. Woo. But they're looking all for those, those fancy people. Oh, they're highly educated. I can tell you right now, I took one year of Bible college. And that was evangelistic studies. I took one year of it. I don't have a degree in theology. But I can tell you one thing. I'm, I'm highly studied in neology. Some of y'all caught it. It's okay. Some people are looking to, 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 to be all highly theological. You can have more degrees than a thermostat. And you could have more titles than Mayweather and still be pretty dumb. You don't believe me? The Pharisees never saw Jesus. The highly learned, a man with a thousand demons saw Jesus. But the man with a thousand degrees didn't. God's not saying, well, I'm looking. You know what? I would pick Sister Ashley if she, had, if she just had a degree in divinity. <laughs> right? I, 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 would, I would use Sister Alex if only she had a degree in evangelistic studies. I don't think I've ever heard that before. You know why? As far as I remember, Peter was a fisherman. David was a shepherd. <laughs> Samson was dealing with lust. Come on. Solomon had how many wives? But God changed every single one of them. God transformed every single one of them and said, I'm going to use you for my purpose. I'm going to use you for my design. It doesn't matter who you used to be. I'm going to change you. Who you are. Oh, I'm talking to somebody right now who's still battling drug addiction, who's still battling alcoholism, who's still saying, you know what? I, well, it's, it's okay because one day we'll get married. Oh, not here, right? That's another church. That's that's a that's a church next door. That's not that's not here. Come on now. 
We need to embrace grace. We need to embrace a new life. Man, living by, we need to live by faith and obedience. Think of the servants at the wedding. They follow Jesus' instructions to fill the jars with water. Then they draw out some of the water at the banquet. They didn't understand what Jesus was doing, but they obeyed. I don't know what you're doing, but okay. Lord, I don't know why I got to deal with my brother the way he acts or my sister the way they talk. And I don't know why I got to deal with my job. And I don't know why I got to deal with my boss. And I don't know why I got to deal with these unruly kids. I don't know why. But God, I know there is a plan and a purpose to your design. Okay, God, if you want me to do it, I'm going to do it. And watch as the miracles begin to flow all because of obedience. Ooh, but Lord, I don't want to. Guess what? I can you imagine if someone says, I don't want to do this. Okay, then you stand outside and you don't get to even perceive the miracle. Our disobedience prevents us from seeing what God really does. Disobedience in life prevents us from spiritual visions of what God's going to plan on doing. You know why? Because those who are spiritually obedient will begin to pray so deep. And they'll be able to say, it had to have been God. There's no other way. There is no other way. Man, Sister Aurelia, you shouldn't have had that. You shouldn't have qualified for the jobs that you have. Right? You shouldn't be there. But God. My goodness. The, mir the miraculous followed obedience. 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 5 or 17 calls us to walk in newness of life, our obedience to Christ. Even though when we don't fully understand the direction, opens the doors to miracles. Our faith, small as it may be, can lead to great information, transformations. So we understand being, what it means to be saved by grace. That you are, you may seem weak. You may seem almost infantile. You may seem like, you know what, I don't think I can do this. But God's grace is sufficient. Now that you've been saved by grace, what do you do then? What? I got saved. Now what, Pastor? I got saved. Now what happens? Seek God's face. Now you're saved. Now you're in the fold. Now, now it's time to seek God's face. And what does seek God's face do? I want you to go with me. Seeking God's face sets a pattern for us from the creation of the world. Six days of work. Notice I'm, I'm setting kind of a pattern for you guys. Okay. The first one was saved by grace, six pots of water. Seeking his face, six days, six days of work. It was followed by a day of rest. Some of y'all like, thank you, Jesus. He said we can rest. He, can, he said, yes, take a nap. God did it. You understand? I'll get you that in a minute. But too many of us are taking too many days of rest. It's, na it's nap time. Mimi's going Mimi's. Let me go Mimi's. Shh, shh, baby sleeping. Baby sleeping. See, this rhythm is not merely about physical labor, but it is also profoundly spiritual in guiding how we interact with God daily. Exodus chapter 20, verse 9. says, for six days you may labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work or your son, or your daughter, or your male servant, or your female servant, or your cattle, or the resident foreigner who is in your gates. I'm pretty sure none of us have servants here, but it's still an understandable pattern. Unless you all like, you're, you're still considered, go give me a soda to your kids. <laughs> Listen. I, I want to kind of set something straight, because a lot of people don't know this. How many of you, being a real question, think that the Sabbath is Sunday? Be real. It's okay. Not, not a wrong question. How many of you guys think the Sabbath is a Sunday? It is not. The Sabbath is Saturday. And I'll explain to you this. When Jesus died on the cross, the reason why they put, they, he went, uh, John uh, from Arimathea went to, uh, to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus, saying that we need to prepare him today because tomorrow we can't because it's the Sabbath. Good Friday, Sabbath. Jesus died and he rose on the third day, which is Sunday. Eventually, also you'll see um, that on, 
when they were in the upper room, they were together praying, and the day after Sabbath, God appeared to them. God appeared to them. And the same thing when, when he appeared to them after the crucifixion. This is the day after the Sabbath. He appeared to them. And again, he appeared to them. It was always the day after the Sabbath. Eventually, in Revelation chapter 1, I believe it's verse 10, it talks about I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. They refer to Sunday being the Lord's day. So, Saturday, that's the reason why you have a weekend. Because then on Saturday, there's supposed to be no work. That's why your job is usually, usually off. And Sunday is the Lord's day. Some of y'all didn't know that. A little education right there. That's, that's documentary channel for me. Sorry. That's, that's all I got for you. you hear me out. <laughs> the rhythm of work and rest comes from God's command. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. This command isn't just about physical rest, but it's about setting a rhythm in our lives. It teaches that our, that our week should be filled with activities that honor God. Your lifestyle should be an, a lifestyle that honors God no matter what you do. Even if you're working, you're honoring God. Even if you're playing, you're honoring God. Some of y'all try to do things and that doesn't honor God, and you wonder, why am I failing? Why am I having situations that's keeping on having these patterns of destruction? Is everything you're doing in a pattern that honors God? Or is it just a pattern of defeat, pattern of, of cycles of defeat? You're wondering why, well, my children are unruly. How much time do you spend with them and God? My marriage is failing. How much time do you spend with your, them and God? Well, my home seems to be not going the right way. How much time do you spend with it and God? How much are they together with God and you? Or is it just you? Well, pastor, you just don't know. I need my me time. Because I have a lot of plans. God laughs when we say that statement. You want to make God laugh? Say the word, my plans. Because many of the plans are a man's heart, but God's word remains forever. But I have plans this weekend. Well, the Lord has other plans. <laughs> it teaches that our week should be filled with things that honor God, our activities that honor God, that, and that seeking his face is a daily endeavor. Woven to every aspect of our lives, not just reserved for the Sabbath, not just reserved for the weekend, not just reserved for the Lord's Day. Daily seeking must be a spiritual discipline. I heard something beautiful, and it really, do, and it really does work. If you want to understand, how many guys wake up in the middle of the night and you feel like you can't go back to sleep? I want you to try something with me. I heard it from one of these. I, I can't remember the name of this guy. He's such a, he's awesome. He's the guy who uh, does this street preaching at the universities, curly hair. Well, he kind of talks like this, uses his hands a lot, and he walks around everywhere. Really awesome. And I, and I was watching one of his uh, preaching sermon uh, videos, and it was really neat. And I was like, you know what? This actually really, really works. The Bible says to meditate on his word and to, to focus on him. So one of his, like, great um, advices was this. Try reciting the Lord's Prayer. And every time you mess up, begin over, begin over, begin over. And you begin to realize you're meditating on God's word. And I started doing the Lord's Prayer. Then I started doing Psalms 23. And it's getting down to the point where my first one was the fruit of the Spirit. So I memorized the fruit of the Spirit this way. Love, joy, peace, patience, good, uh, kindness, goodness, patience, gentleness, and self-control. I started doing it so I can start memorizing it. And now I realized I was meditating on God's word in the middle of the night. I was like, dang, that's cool. That's what it means to seek God's face. Even when you're not, in, you're not at church, start speaking God's word over your life. The Bible says he'll keep them in perfect peace whose mind is set upon the Lord. You, why, why are you so busy trying to count sheep when you should be talking to the shepherd? Come on. Six days of work represent our active pursuit of God through prayer, scripture, and reading, and living out our life, faith, uh, of our faith in the world. These days are, are our opportunity to gauge deeply with God's word, to see his hand in our daily task and, our, and our communicate with him in, through prayer. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13 says, you will seek me. Oh, come on. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with what? All your heart and soul. Oh, let me, let me keep that up there for a second. If you seek me with all your heart and soul, go to the next one. I will make myself available to you. Say, oh, cut up. If you will seek me with all your heart and seek me, I will make my, I will make myself available to you. 
Some people are trying to get themselves available to the CEO and the owners of their company. Let me just, God, can you, can I make a, 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 a moment where we can just have a, no, I'd rather seek God that he would make himself available to says the Lord. Then I will reserve your, I will reserve your plight and will regather you from all the nations and all the places I have, I, I've exiled you, says the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from which I exiled you. You've been scattered abroad, but if you seek me with all your heart, I'll bring you back. And I will, not only that, draw close to me, I'll draw close unto you. This is confirmation. I will make myself available to you. You see, you need to understand what it means to rest in God's presence. Resting in God's presence, this comes from the Sabbath, a divine pause, a day set aside not just for physical rest but for spiritual renewal. This is our time to stop, reflect, and enjoy uninterrupted communion with our creator. This is a time for you to say, you know what, this is God's day. I'm going to do whatever it takes. You see, our plan is eventually at the last Sunday of May to have a Sunday morning and a Sunday night service just for that one. And I'm going to be honest. This is where it's, I'm going to step on some toes. No one's going to like it, and you're going to get all upset, but I got the mic, and I kind of don't care. <laughs> you know why it's hard for us to plan a revival weekend? Because some people don't even like coming to youth nights. You know why we can't plan a revival weekend? Because we can't even get you to come to Saturdays and Sundays at the same time. But send us revival now. <laughs> we want the fire of the Holy Spirit. I want my children changed. I want, I want God to move them. I want to see signs and wonders. God, you said you would pour your spirit upon all flesh in the latter days. Yeah, he's going to. And, and he will because that's his promise. But what are you doing to see it? If we wanted to have a Friday Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday uh, like a real out, straight out, like old school tent revival. I know exactly who I can expect. I need water. I mean, where's the lie? But pastor, you don't. You just don't know my week. Oh, trust me, I got the same. I got. I know that week. I got you. You guys ever try and watch Daniel by yourself? I know the week. Trust me, <laughs> bro. I can only have so much information on tornadoes. We'll go there. We'll keep going. You see, when we come together with God and say, you know what? Everything I do, I do it for you, God. It's for your glory. It's for your kingdom. It's a day to replenish our spiritual reserves to worship in community and to celebrate the joy of our relationship with God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 9 through 10 speaks about the Sabbath rest for the people of God. Consequently, the Sabbath rest remains for the people of God. How funny is it, those who don't believe in God, oh, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a day for me to rest. Where'd you get that from? Right? Right? You see, we need to understand what it means to balance and work and worship. In our pursuit of God's face, we must balance our spiritual work as a spiritual rest. Like the land that was worked for six years and then rested the seventh in Leviticus chapter 25, our souls need a cycle of engagement and recovery. Yes, I fully understand there will be times for us, but we've been in a cycle of rest for a very long time. It's time for us to get to work. If we want revival, it's going to take some work. Maybe this coming season is a time for us to finally get some work because on the seventh year, my God says, you know what, take a rest because I'm about to do my work. We're going into a sixth year. What work have we done? Pastor Anthony, have we had a revival weekend? Being real. Everyone's looking. Some of y'all didn't even have to look. I can tell you, Pastor, no. The best we've had is when we had services, no one preached. God spoke for three, four hours. We were at this altar crying, playing the same exact song. 
We never change the song. Am I right? Or am I, for the Carlos, am I right? He's the one playing the same chords over and over. Can we change this song just a minute? <laughs> Pastor Anthony playing the same drums. But all we did was get caught up in the face of God, seeking his face. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, turn away from the wicked wave and seek my face. That scripture is not just there just because, you know what, it's, a, it's good words. No. The balance keeps our faith fresh in our hearts and aligned with God. But here's the thing. Well, I'm feeling burnout. I'm feeling like, you know what, I just, I really can't do this. I'll tell you why you're feeling it. You ready for this? Because any time we ask you to do anything in God, it just burns you out because you're doing too much of an other thing. There's no balance. You're more... You're more leaning to the things of this world and doing things for this world. And well, I, I got TV to watch. I got I got my job. You just don't understand my job. You just don't understand my boss. You know, I got this. I got this. I got this. But how much time are you really actually balancing with with God? How much time are you actually praying? How much time are you actually studying? How much time are you actually pray, in 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 communion with God? That's why you're feeling a burnout, because when all, when you find a place of balance, God gives you rest. God gives you rest. So in embracing this rhythm of work and rest, we need to commit to seeking God's face, not only in our active days, but also in the quiet moments. Some of y'all don't even, man, y'all still play 90s music on the ways to, on the ways to work. No, you not even worship. Right? We'll go, that's, that's a whole other sermon. We'll leave that for another time. So now we talked about, uh, sorry, saved by grace. Seek God's face to love the lost. Now, the love of the lost is not easy because sometimes it's hard. We're going to talk about Goliath's six cubits of height. It's not easy to love the lost. It is hard. Why? Because they don't look like you. They don't sound like you. They don't act like you. They don't always be just like you. Right? I was here yesterday. We were dropping off clothes. And as I'm walking in, this gentleman is walking. He's like, his sleeveless shirt, pants, just, hey, man, do um, you have anything to help me out? It's like, do you have any clothes? That you, like, you look like you're kind of like, you're thirsty. Yeah, man, I got, literally, I'm, I feel like I'm cooking out here. So I was like, you know what? You came at the right time. This is a divine moment. Because what was I bringing inside? I was bringing in clothes. And they all fit him. <laughs> I was like, belt size and everything? I mean, I gave him shorts. And it, and. I got it from my boss, so none of that stuff was like cheap. It was like Lucky Brand jeans, uh, Nike shirt. It was a Nike, all of his golf shirts. So I was like, this is going to be good for you, especially out in this heat. It'll breathe. So I was like, give him that. I went in the back. I got some waters. We had those. I'm sorry if I, I tapped in somebody's reserves. Those was like sweetbreads. I opened up a box and grabbed out two of them. I gave him both. Don't, don't, don't judge me. I didn't take one. <laughs> I gave him, he got both. But that's all I could find. And I was like, all right. I hope you can come back tomorrow. I understood from my, my heart. I was like, you know what? He just needs something right now. Okay, this is the season. But sometimes you're going to love on people that aren't going to smell the best. I've hugged on some people that just, <laughs> I'm trying my best, like, breathe. <laughs> what? Right, we've been there, right? Some right. of y'all don't know Brother Jimmy's testimony. Brother Jimmy came straight up from the streets. He used to live right there underneath the bridge on, on Grand and 27th Avenue, I believe it was, right? Yeah, so he's, he would come in the church. Pastor Zeke, we used to have this church that was right here on, on uh, 31st and, and Thomas, right next to Burger Shop. We had a back house. We'd open up the back house, let him get cleaned up. Now, you gotta, you're living in your own place? Own it. Own it. Own it. Owns his own place. He's, he's getting his truck fixed. He's got a jo great job. Oh, you guys know the envelopes you guys hear? He's the one who prints them. That's what he does. He, does, he, print, he prints those. We, he's the one who from off the streets. Why? All because one person loved on someone that didn't look like they were lovable. All because you love on someone that doesn't look like you. Doesn't may not have all the same amount of teeth as you. It doesn't matter. I'm not talking about you, Brother Jeremy. I just happen to be in the same place. Sorry. I just, I, 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 wasn't, I just realized I said that. I wasn't talking about you directly, Brother Jeremy. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I was, I'm so sorry. 
Hey, but hey, he still he can still share the love of God. I'm going to be real. He may not, but he still shares a lot more than some of y'all do. You don't need to have him to, to tell them that Jesus loves you. Listen to me. Listen to me. We've been out to, tomorrow they go out to Chicken Park at 8.30. I believe it is, 8.30. They're going out, you guys don't know what Chicken Park is, huh? Yeah, what the, what's the real name of it? It's like 50, that's what they call it, 50, 59th and Glendale. Bethany, Bethany home. Is it Cesar Travis? No. It's one of those parks. 59th and Bethany. Bethany, yes. It's always on the south side. And they always hear that there's always people in the park. And we've seen these people that are young. I'm kidding you not. Sometimes they look like they're 16 years old. And then I followed this group on Instagram. It's called the Streets of Phoenix. And it hurts my heart because sometimes they'll show videos of 14-year-olds that are still in the streets, strung out on meth, strung out on blues, strung out on all this just junk. Who's loving on them? Why? Because the city and the system has turned their back on them. The city pushes them out and does sweeps and tells them, you can't stay here. You know what? You just don't make this place look great. Fonzo Park. That's what it's called. But listen, loving the lost is not going to be easy. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a giant sometimes we have to overcome. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 4 says, The champion came up from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath of, from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Standing six cubits and a span, Goliath was not just a physical giant, but a symbol of great challenges we face. Some of us just feel like we can't share the gospel. We feel like we can't speak the God. We feel like we can't preach the God. We feel like we can't talk. We feel like we can't share anything. So it becomes this giant. Well, pastor, you just don't know me. I'm just a bit of a shy person. That's your giant. The giant that's keeping your mouth shut. You know how I know that giant exists? Because it happened with the Israelites. Because when, uh, when Goliath spoke, every single one of them didn't say a word. It wasn't until someone who realized that their God is bigger than a giant stood up and says, you cursed my God too. No, that you're done. It's today's it. That's it. We're done. David came up and said, you know what? I'm done with this. Goliath will shut the mouths of those who are meant to be bold. Goliath's stature represents the daunting challenges we encounter in our mission to reach the loss. These challenges can be societal differences, personal biases, or even our own fears. Yet the height of Goliath reminds us of the scale of our task. Significant, yes, but not insurmountable with God. David's faith, uh, David faced Goliath not with the conventional armor of a warrior. Saul said, here, put on my armor. And he tried to, and it didn't fit. You're going to have to go fight some battles. You cannot wear the armor of your brother or your sister. Oh, listen to me, children. You can't go into war trying to wear the armor of your mama and your daddy. Their salvation ain't going to help you win, uh, win this battle. You need your own armor. You need to get in this way. You need to seek God. It's your relationship with God that's going to make the difference. Yours. You can't expect, well, I go to church and they're saved, so I guess I'll be okay. Understand that sometimes parents make bad decisions and they do bad things. You don't believe me? Did you watch what happened over this, uh, this eclipse? I was saddened to hear that. A mom who was ill-informed. She thought that the, the eclipse was the apocalypse. She thought it was. Because she was so heavily into astrology, she thought, you oh, know, this is it, this is over. So she went home. Yeah. And she killed the father of her children. And she threw her babies out the car while she was driving. Yeah. On a freeway. One of them was a little little infant. The other one's like eight years old. That one I believe that one survived. She crashed head onto a tree and she killed herself. Parents, if you don't know the difference between truth and falsehoods, you bleed that to your children. If you're not willing to stand up against the giants of this world, if you're not willing to stand up against the persecutions of this world, it will shut your mouth and others will fall.
You see, David's victory over Goliath was not about his strength. It was not about David's strength. David didn't have any strength. David was like a little boy. He didn't have strength. But he had the strength of the Holy Spirit. He had the strength of God in his life. It was the power of God. This victory illustrates God's provisions when we are committed to his cause. See, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul writes to the church of Philippi, in prison. He's in jail writing a letter. He's, he's like, I, I'm going through all this stuff. Back at, even as I go through this, I am able to do all things through the one who strengthened me. Even from jail, even in his persecution, he can say, I can still do what God has called me to do. When we reach out to the lost, we cannot rely on your capabilities. Maybe you know, I, I well, Pastor, I just, I just, I don't know the word. Share your love of what God has done in your life. You don't got to be like highly educated. They don't care how much you know. They just want to know that you care. They need to see that God's power worked in your life. When we start sharing our testimonies, that last time that I was there, man, God started to move. Why? Because if God can save them, God can save me. If God can redeem them, God can redeem me. If God can heal them, God can heal me. Why? Because I've seen him do it before. Facing the giants in our, in our mission to love the lost demands courage. It requires us to be proactive, stepping out of the comfort zones and into arenas where the battles of souls uh, are, are fought for. We need to be motivated by the love of Christ, compelling us to act and to reach those who have yet to hear his saving grace. Okay, we got saved. We're seeking his face. Now it's time for us to go get others. Go and make disciples. Or are we just, we got saved by grace. Now we're seeking his face, and we want revival. But no one else is coming in. Us four and no more, God. We've reserved the church to be in the four walls, and that's it. Well, as long as it's here, that's it. We're done. That's all we need. God is saying, no. It wasn't just meant for just you. It was meant for all. Your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, the ones you don't even talk to. Some of us have people in our lives we haven't talked to in years. Why? Because hurt, unforgiveness has kept us from them. And God is saying, maybe you're the one. Maybe you're the one that reaches out to them. But I can't, I can't forgive them for what they did. But if God uses you to forgive them, and you forgive, and now there's amending between, who's to say that's not the moment that they can receive God's forgiveness? We've got to continue to embrace and live out our commitment to love the lost. We've got to remember these battles are not won by our might, but by the Spirit of the Lord, according to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. So we talked about the first three. What's the first one? Saved by grace. What's the second one? Seek his face. What's the third one? The last one. Revival. At all costs. What does that mean? What does it mean to say revival at all costs? Revival at all costs. We have to consider the majestic throne of Solomon. I was like reading this. I was like, it, it, it's one of those scriptures you kind of pass over. And it didn't mean anything to me the first time. To me, it was just by, by the fourth or fifth time, I finally went, whoa, I didn't. Why is that? By the time I started rereading, I was like, why would God say that? There's, there's no reason that the Bible just has scripture or words in the Bible just to have them. There's always a reason to the imagery. There's always a reason to the words that are written there. Why is that? Go with me, 1 Kings chapter 10. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 19. There were six, six steps leading up to the throne, and the back of it was rounded at the top. The throne had two armrests with a statue of a lion standing on each side. There were 12 statues of lions on the six steps, one lion at each end of each step. There was nothing like it in any other kingdom. Before I even get to the steps, I need to explain the imagery. Keep that up there, please. 
There are 12 statues of lions on the six steps. I wish we, I almost wish we had six steps to kind of show it to you. So at the, each end of the step, there was a lion. So this is a big step. Okay? Step one, step two, all the way up, going all the way up to the throne. Can you imagine that? Lion on both sides. No matter the steps you take in your life, and at the closer you even get to begin to ascend closer with God, understand that the lion is with you every single step you take. It doesn't matter how hard it is, the lion's with you. It doesn't matter how heavy it is, the lion's with you. It doesn't matter where is where is the lion? He's to my left and he's to my right. And it always seems to be those moments that we look to our left and to our right when we feel like we're going through the hardest of situations. Understand. And then when you even get to the throne, there's still lions there. The first step that we see here, I promise you, I'm getting close. The first step that we that takes us higher with God. You need to understand that first step is always going to be humility. The first step, you got to understand, humble yourself before the Lord. You either humble yourself or God's going to do it. Trust me, I would rather do it to myself than have God do it. Because when God humbles you, man, you ain't never had, I don't know if anybody's ever been in church where God read your mail in front of everybody. I'm just saying. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2 tells us, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. Comes wisdom. When we seek revival, when we seek the fire of God, when we see that, we must start with a humble acknowledgement that, that our need for God is, must be paramount. Recognizing that without him, I can do nothing. Your very first step is, I realize I am knowing I am no one, I am nothing. I am literally coming out of the dust to take my first step higher up. I need to understand who I am. I don't care if you're a supervisor. I don't care if you're in management. I don't care if you're in ministry. I don't care if you're a pastor, a co-pastor, whatever. Even myself, I've said it here myself, that I am no one, I am nothing. I am but dust. I have to realize and stay and know that I have to be in a state of constant humility because if I am not, Trust me, God will, will humble you in a minute. You don't believe me? Here I am going to throw some stuff on my, on my own self. There was a time in my life when I first started preaching, I thought I was all that. I thought I was good. I was like, man, I'm getting ready to preach. I'm getting ready to go. And all of a sudden afterwards, my dad goes, you know, you did really good, but I couldn't pay attention. He's like, why? Your fly was down the whole time. <laughs> And I thought I was telling funny jokes, but apparently when I was moving over, <laughs> you could just see my underwear. <laughs> I was like, you couldn't tell me? I was, I was, I was, oh, I thought you were telling me to turn it up. <laughs> like, if we don't keep on, that's ah, okay. You guys can just have that one. It's okay. Good job, McFly. If we are not willing to humble ourselves, God will do it. And he'll do it in ways where you think that you're, you're in your highest moment. Second step is prayer. It's dedicated prayer. Acts chapter 1, verse 14 describes the early church continually devoting themselves to prayer. All these continued pr together in prayer with one mind. As they prayed, the Holy Spirit moved powerfully among them, leading the, the revival at Pentecost. Our persistent, fervent prayers laid down groundwork for God's Spirit to move among us. Step three, obedience. Humbleness means that we're willing to obey. Humbleness means that we go before God and we're willing to listen to what he says. Again, back to the, the servants of Cana. Cana, they... They listened. But God, I'm giving you a sacrifice of praise, but you're not being obedient to what I've asked you to do. But God, I give a lot of tithes, but you're still not being obedient to, to my words. But God, I, 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 I make sure that I'm there early every service, but you're not being obedient at home. You're still living out of sin. You're still living out of wedlock. You're still living out of, in, in addiction. Obedience is better than sacrifice. 
Just as Solomon followed God's law to establish his throne, we must align our lives with God's word. John chapter 14, 15 reminds us, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Obedience positions us to receive and sustain revival. Obedience. Step four. Faith. Ooh. Why faith? Because Hebrews chapter 11 says that without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Right. How You want revival, you want miracles, you want power, you want the glory of God. That's great. But what happens if you, do, if you just don't believe him? You, I'm sorry. You want, you want peace, you want all this stuff. You want the blessings of God, but you don't want the blesser. You want the, the, the blessing, but not the blesser. You want the healing, but not the healer. You have to have the other one. You have to have the latter. You have to have him first. And he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Our faith invites the miraculous. It's the essential of revival. When you begin to see signs and wonders, you'll be able to understand that's, that's revival. God's moving. God's doing a miracle. People were too focused on an ex-witch leading baptisms more than the fact that there was over two, 300 baptisms. I'm being real. She got saved by the power of the Holy Spirit and now leading many to Christ out in the middle of the ocean doing two, 300 gender baptisms, they were more focused on who she was and not who God is. My goodness. We'll get into that story another time. Step number five. Unity. Mm, you can't get to step six without step five. You can't get up higher unless you already have step five. But you know what? No, it's okay. I, I don't really get along with that brother. I don't get along with that, that sister. I don't get along with the, their kids. But I think we'll be okay. Yeah. I'm going to love them anyhow. My goodness. Psalms 133 verse 1. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Unity among believers amplifies the power of our prayers and our ministry. Look in Acts. When they were together. When they were together with God, it amplified their prayers. It amplified miracles. It created an environment where revival could flourish. Step number six. I'm getting close. Pastor uh, Brother Carl, just go ahead and come on up before I keep on going into the whole sermon. <laughs> Step number six. Sacrifice. The final step is sacrifice. Revival comes at a cost often requiring us to give up our comfort, give up our time, give up our resources. Mark chapter 8, verse 34 says, deny ourselves and take up, take up a cross and follow Jesus. He called the crowd along with the disciples and said to them, if anybody wants to become my followers, he must deny himself. Denying yourself means it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about him. It's always been about him. Our willingness to sacrifice is crucial to revival, to take root and to spread. But now we're here at a place where it costs us. How do we go higher from here? If there's only six steps, how do we go higher? Guess what? There's nothing you can do. There's nothing. You want to go higher, but there's, now you've done everything you can do. You're now at the top four. Okay, I, I, I've done all the steps, God. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've put myself through humility. I've gone to your self in prayer. I've gone. I'm, I'm trying to live a life of obedience. I'm living a life by faith, God. I want to be in unity with my brothers. And God, I'm sacrificed. I'm, 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 I'm all there. And God's saying, you know what? You're right. You're there. But now it's nothing you can do. Now this is where I begin to work. The next level up, it's a divine intervention. It's divine intervention. It's now God stepping in. It represents God's sovereign act of bringing revival to completion. It is where we acknowledge that while we prepare uh, and make room for revival, it is ultimately God who initiates and perfects it. 
it is not us who sets the flame. It is God who sets the flame of revival. It's not us. You can't do anything. You can't go, you know what, if I just get this pastor to preach, if I just get this minister to minister, if I just get this worship singer to sing, maybe revival will happen. No, it has nothing to do with us. Nothing. Everything to do with God. Everything. He starts the flame. It is ultimately God who initiates and perfects it. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in us and you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. This next level up, this next level higher, is a reminder that revival is not something we can manufacture. You can't manufacture revival. It requires God's powerful intervention. Our role is to set the stage, is to set the atmosphere through our, our prayer. That's why we have preheat prayer before service. That's why we have worship. It's to set the atmosphere. But it still requires God's powerful intervention. We call upon the Lord to send his powerful spirit, knowing that he can do immeasurably more and, uh, than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work with us, uh, within us, as it says in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, 3 verse 20. As we begin to go up these steps closer to God, humility, prayer, obedience, faith, unity, and sacrifice, we align ourselves more closely with God's will, beginning to foster an environment of revival. I want you to stand with me. As we get ready to close, and as we get ready to have a moment with God, We need to commit to climbing these steps together. Fervently seeking a deeper move with God's spirit. As we step into this new year, we need to move forward with faith and clear purpose. God has big plans for us. They are unfolding day by day. You trust me, trust me, there's, there's a lot happening that we haven't talked to you about. But there's more moving. God has special moments planned for us coming up. We need to walk into this year ready. Well, I don't know if I'm willing to commit. That's okay. Love you. God loves you. But those who are willing to be obedient in God's word, not mine, not the pastor's preaching, God's word. Being willing to submit themselves to God's word, not mine. I'm not telling you to be a, a slave here. I'm asking you to be a servant of God. When you do that, you'll begin to witness the miraculous. We need to embrace a new chapter that God's taking us. I invite you to, to join me at this altar. If you're saying, Pastor, I'm with you. This next year, I'm, this sounds like it's going to be a great journey. Maybe this is your first time here, and that's fine. But maybe you're asking, God, I need to see if there's more to this. I need to understand, is there really more to God than what people have told me online? Is there really more to God than what I've ever seen before? Is there really more to God than what I see on the internet? If that's you, if you really want to find out if there's more, I encourage you to join us up there at this altar. You don't have to, I'm not asking you to tell me your name. I'm not asking you that, I'm just telling you. Come to this altar and say, you know what? There has to be more. I can't, I can't stay in the same place I was before. We need to commit together to pursue the vision with renewed passion that we are saved by grace. But after that, we seek God's face. And now others need to hear about him, so we need to love the lost to go to a higher level of glory with God, to see revival in Arizona, no matter what cost it takes. We need to make this year shine brighter than last year. We need to drive it hard with our faith and by the power of the grace of God. We need to move forward with purpose with our hearts full of hope. Trust me, 
through God, with God, all things are possible. I want you to just lift your hands as I pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you with hearts open and spirits willing, ready to embrace the mission and the vision you have set before Crossway Church. Lord, we are saved by grace. Let this profound truth resonate within us, empowering us to live lives transformed by your love. Fill us, God. Fill us, your children, with the Spirit's new wine. As promised in Joel chapter 2, verse 28, turning our hearts of stone into hearts that beat for your glory. As we strive to seek your face, grant us the diligence and the devotion to encounter you in every moment of our lives. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Psalms 90, or 27. May our days of work be filled with the presence. And on the seventh, let us find rest and rejuvenation in your holy sanctuary, remembering your command in Exodus chapter 20. God, ignite in us a love for the lost. A fierce and bold as David before Goliath. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Let us not be daunted by the size of the task, but inspired by the greatness of our God. Equip us with courage and compassion to reach those who are still searching for hope. God, we commit to revival at all costs. Like Solomon, we desire to build a place of wisdom and worship, ascending the six steps to your throne with purity, passion. Unite us, Father. As we sacrifice our comforts for the cause of Christ, seeking a spiritual renewal that touches every corner of our community, inspired by your work, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2, O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. We pray for your divine help as we commit to being disciples who love you deeply and serve others sacrificially, guiding others to faith in Jesus Christ, fostering meaningful relationships and impacting the world by serving those in need. Let our efforts bring both physical relief and spiritual renewal as we work tirelessly to create a community passionate about following you. Lord, unite us in this purpose, casting aside petty differences or excuses that might hinder us. Equip us, your church, to stand out this year as a testament to your grace, power, and transformative love. In all things, May we glorify you, trusting in your perfect plan and timing. In all these things, in the mighty name of Jesus, we ask, who makes all things new. Jesus. Father, if there be anybody here, anybody here that would like to recommit their heart back to God, to have a closer relationship with God, maybe you've been far for a while. Maybe you've had a little bit of doubt kind of come in right recently and that's why you're here you've had a little bit of pain come in recently and that's why you're here God does not bring you to a place just because of happenstance luck or coincidence he brings you for a purpose you needed to hear this you needed these words and he felt like this it felt like he was felt like man that man was preaching right to me if I, was, if I was sharing words, it was not me speaking. It was God speaking to you. Right. If you feel a need in your heart, maybe you just want to get a closer relationship with God, I encourage you. You're going to have to step out of old seasons. Step out of old wineskins and step into new. Come on up. You don't have to tell me what's going on. Don't have to say anything. Don't have to say anything. You don't have to say anything. Just come up here and say, God, that's me. I want a better relationship with you. I want a better life with you. I've done it my way for so long. I've walked my way. I've thought my way. I've done it my own way for so long. And it feels like I've only put myself in a deeper situation, deeper problems. If that's you, come on up. It's okay. Maybe you've been coming here for five years. Maybe you've been coming here for two years. Maybe you've been coming here for a couple of days. Maybe you've been first time here. God is speaking to you. That's it. 
I want a closer relationship with you. I want a deeper relationship with you. I want a deeper relationship with you, God. I don't want to be the same person I once was. I want to be who you called me to be. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I will stand up against the giants. I will stand up against the enemies at the gates of the hell. I will do whatever it takes, God. But I will stand firm on your word. It is your word that is a firm foundation. All else is sinking sand. It is only by your name that we are saved. For you are the way, the truth, and the life. For there is no other way to the Father except through you. God, let me have that deep relationship. In Jesus' name. Amen. This is how I find my battles. God, draw me close. This is how I find my battles. Draw me close. Draw me close, God. Right now in the name of Jesus. I draw close to you, oh God. For you are my helper. You are my helper. You are my helper. You are my helper. This is how I find my This is how. This is it. Come on. That's it. I surrender it all. I surrender it all. That's it. Right now in the name of Jesus. This is how I find my Just a closer walk with him. Just a closer walk with him. This is how I find my battles. Is there anyone else? Father God for her friends. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded. Oh, it may look like I'm surrounded. It may look like I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded by you. God's calling you. Don't run. You've already run for a long time. You've run from God for a very long time. Don't do it anymore. Find rest in Him. It's hard for you to refer to God as the Father because you yourself didn't have one. Or the one that you had didn't act like one. And God is telling you, find rest in me. If that's you, this is how I find just say, God, change my heart. Change my heart. I'm tired of trying to make ends meet and never, and never doing it, God. I need you. God, we need you. As a church, this should be something we memorize and keep in our hearts. What is our purpose? What is the vision of Crossway Church? Say, I am saved by grace. To seek his face. To love the loss. To see revival at all costs. That is our vision. That is who we are. You're not meant to just survive. 
It's time that you stop surviving and start living for Christ. I want you to say it one more time. Say, I am saved by grace. To seek his face. To love the lost. To see revival at all costs. Jesus, every hand lifted. Father God, we thank you for five years. We thank you for five years that you have kept us. You've watched over us. You've taken us from glory to glory. And we thank you as we go on into year six. Pastors, can I have you come up, please? Just stay right there. I just want the pastors to come up, please. You guys can come up here. I've asked them to share about a minute or two just their heart as we prepare to go into this next season. Don't worry, it's not another it's not another preaching. But I just asked them to share something. These men have stood by my side. Pastor Chris, I've known for many years, but it wasn't until a couple of years ago that man do we just see a flourishment. And I don't know when God is going to do it, but I know that God's going to call you. I would be selfish, self-centered, egotistical if I didn't recognize that. Many pastors just want to keep people locked in their doors. And how many, how many numbers can they grow? One day, God's going to call you. And that might be Crossway Mesa. I don't know. Crossway California. I don't know. But I know that there is a calling on your life. And I thank God for every moment I've asked, can you be here? Well, I'll be there, Pastor. Faithful. Powerful. Amen, amen. As our senior pastor was given a vision, and he's given us a purpose, not just as pastors, but, uh, but as a congregation to be in alignment of the vision that God has placed over this house. Saved by grace, seek his face, love the lost, revival at all cost. I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with one of those today, saved by grace. See, I'm up here because I was saved by the grace of God. See, you're looking at a walking, talking testimony. The way I walk, the way I talk, the way I carry myself, I'm a representation of the love of Jesus. And how Jesus loved me so much. See, I might have tattoos and stuff like that, and I might talk different. I might talk like, I, or I like I'm like I'm a white boy. You know what I mean? But this wasn't. I couldn't describe it any other way. But I didn't. I didn't look like this before. I used to look like a gangbanger. I used to be in the streets doing things of the world. But see, it was the grace of God. God said, "You know what? I'm going to take this guy. This guy that's tatted up." that was drug addiction, that was bound by so many things, by lust, perversion, drug addiction. I used to be a drug dealer doing all these things. God said, I'm going to take him and I'm going to utilize this man and I'm going to rise him up and I'm going to have him go out there and preach the gospel to a lost, to a broken world. But first he had to say, you know what? You have to surrender yourself. Surrender everything. The way you talk the way you walk, the people you hang out with, I'm going to remove all those things and I'm going to replace it with some godly men, some godly women. I'm going to give you a wife that is in alignment with the same vision. She's going to let you lead the family. So I'm here to tell you guys, you can do it. See, I'm standing up here as a walking, breathing testimony of God's grace and mercy. And see, sometimes you will fall away. See, as the Bible says, a righteous man may fall seven times, but he gets back up. See, I fell off and then God rise me back up. He said, come on, come on, come on, soldier get back up. God is telling someone today to rise up, soldier. Grab your sword. Grab the word of God and preach it. Come on, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God. We give him the praise, honor, and glory for what he's about to do this year. Amen. Pastor Lewis, man, when you came in, you said the sermon that I was preaching Funny enough, goes along with the second pillar and does seek his face was the fire of the Holy Spirit. Man, y'all probably don't remember how we started out doing uh, Bible study online 
it was me on my in my house, and then it was Pastor Michael doing it remotely as well. And then we started doing it here at the church, and then Pastor Lewis started coming in. What I can say about this is, man, you you push me to my limits. You push me not not a bad way. Where Mike, when he would just start spitting the scripture, I was like, okay, I think I need up my game. <laughs> but it's been in a good way. Every time we talk. It's never just for five minutes. It's not. It's like sometimes it'll be an hour. I'm like, but I see the tenderness of your heart. And I thank God that you're still here, still faithful, working hard. Praise the Lord, everyone. Let's give God a hand, praise. Man, God is so good. Um, one of the things I wanted to say uh, briefly is that my wife and I, when I met my wife at Prayer House Sanctuary, I served faithfully there for uh, two years. And God was bringing a new chapter in my life. I went through a divorce. And then once I closed that season by serving faithfully under Pastor Trotter, I was talking to my best friend, Anthony. I've known Anthony for about 25 years. And I never knew we was going to be connected. You know what I mean? Um, but he was always there to encourage me. And uh, so that was an act of providence there. But God sent me here, and I met Pastor Jeremy. And But during COVID, it was interesting because I remember I was sitting here, and Pastor Jeremy was uh, preaching something called the altar. And I felt a spark in me. Now, I was saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and, and I loved the Lord, but there was something about when he was preaching, and it sparked something, a fire in me, and, and whatever that fire was, it was burning and burning. I came back again, and I caught fire of the Holy Spirit, and I seen the ministry just explode going out in the streets. And I said, what is this? And then it was time. It was time for me to come here. And, and you know what? When you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he'll lift you up. And there's always going to be promotion when you're faithful to God. I was promoted. And I remember I, I went to sleep and I got caught up in a vision. And I saw a man with hands and he put his hands on my head. And it was fire in his hands. And I screamed and the fire was heavy. And then my wife spoke to me and she said, God is going to call you to be a pastor. The book of Jeremiah says, God is the one that ordains pastors. A shepherd that watches over his sheep to protect them, to guide them, to love on them and protect them from hurt, harm, and danger. And then I was ordained a pastor. And I didn't know that God was going to do that. But for all those that are here, there is a plan and a purpose and a call for your life. So step into your calling. Acknowledge God in all your ways and he will direct your path. And he will continue to transform you and change you in his image. So my, my prayer is that we will stay unified and remember this. Jesus said, upon this rock shall I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God bless you. This young man, twenty-four this year. God, twenty-four years ago, this young man has run my life. My nephew. I could not even imagine what God was going to do with your life. I, could, I tell me, twenty-four years ago, this. This little boy's gonna be passionate. I would, I wouldn't have said yes. Why? Because 24 years ago, your dad wasn't even serving God. But when I saw your little blonde head, I was like, man, you know what? There is something different about him. But now I can say, 
one of the most powerful teachers I know, know personally, one of the most powerful teachers I know is Pastor Michael. This man is the epitome of Second Timothy. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that may not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I thank God for my nephew, but I thank more God for Pastor Michael. You may be my nephew, but I will always honor you as a pastor of this house. I love you, big guy. If I could get the lights on so I could see your beautiful faces. There you go. I like looking at people. Amen. Go ahead and cut the music for just a moment. So I wasn't, while we, you know, kind of praying and thinking about, okay, God, what are you saying for the people? And God speaks to me, not just through physical ailments, but also what he's feeling and for the next year coming up is in the heart. And I feel very strongly, one, I want to exhort you all for who have served in ministry, who are starting to serve in ministry. You know, Brother Alex stepping up, especially within um, not just in, in humility and in character, but also with serving. All of you have come a long way. Hermanos, uh, Fabian and Ramiro, love you guys. There's a lot of people that came in through here miss him and we love him still we keep him in prayer but for our, everyone that's here there's so much you can just point out name each person but i know that this next year the lord is going to do a deeper work within your, all of our hearts yeah. and if you're all faithful to submit yourself to the ministry of purification the what was lost will be restored some of you had a ministry and it fell and it fell off some of you had a burning passion and it fell off some of you may be doubting or wavering, but uh, I guarantee if you, within this next year, really allow the Lord to do the work of purification in your heart, you will see a radical, radical transformation. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter what sins you committed. You all have a testimony and you all have a purpose. And I know that within, for the ministry, God is looking at you. God is looking at every single one of you to see wh how you will handle yourself. The way you handle yourself is the way you will handle this ministry. And not even just to be a pastor, but to work with some of your kids, not even as a youth pastor, just to mess around and have fun with them. Before a youth pastor, I'm an older brother. Before a pastor, I'm a brother. I'm your guys' brother more than I am your pastor. Uh, you don't need to call me pastor. You just call me brother. That's all I need. But for your kids, I can make sure that people know this. I love your kids very deeply. I will push them. Spiritually, there are times where we may get a little physical and it happens, but it's all in love. All in love. And I just know that this year, far in the mountain, we'll keep we've already stepped into year six, but... We're walking in it. Fire on the mountain will kick off into year six. We're feeling it. If you can be there, I encourage you to be there. Talk to Pastor Jeremy. There's a way to, to work it out where we can get you there. A lot of all the unsung heroes. Mama Linda. Sister Ann, even, always with the kids. Diana, always with the kids. You know, people that do all the behind the work scenes that we don't really see. We are to give honor to them, too. The worship ministry, the intercession ministry is beautiful and it's the face of it, but as, you know, Fabian Ramiro know, showing up at 8 in the morning, 7.30, Brother, Al or Brother Robert, to get everything set up in the back, the work that you don't see. People who come in during the week to clean. There is a ministry here for you you can help serve in. Because God wa doesn't want you busy, but he wants you active. And as you grow in serving others, the Bible says that grow in love for Christ and in your love for each other. That's when you start walking in a true revival. And I just know very strongly, submit yourself to the Lord, to his work in your life. And he will restore what was lost, and he will restore what was broken. Some of you do have a calling, not just in high level, but um, 
It's in a greater level of influence. May not be in the platform, but in your work. Some of you were very zealous, but over time, over the attacks of the enemy, your zeal has fallen. This year is a year to get set ablaze again. The newcomers welcome you. For those who are third, second, first time, maybe it's been a while since you came to church, welcome. And I love every single one of you. It's amazing to see you all faces. You're all our brothers and sisters. Look at your person left and right. They're your sister and they're your brother. They're not, you know, out for your harm. We're here to, to take the ministry into the fulfillment of what the Lord has for it. Do not, and I say this from a pure heart, do not despise one another. The Bible says if you hate your brother, then you can't love God. Love each other. Those you may have had a problem with, you need to ask them for forgiveness because you're the one that's holding that anger. Amen. As you, as you were speaking, I, it's November. November it'll be 10 years am I glad I went to feel the Lord <laughs> 10 years ago he pulled me and Anthony into the room and said to us I don't know what's going to happen God's going to do something powerful in this place. That night, from this pulpit, he was preaching. I went to be with the Lord. Five years later, Crossway was established. Another five years later, here we are. I can't, I don't think I could have done this without, I'm being real, without what first and foremost God, but I don't think I could have done it without Anthony. He don't look like my brother. Some of y'all don't, some of y'all still don't question that. These look, those look like brothers. Me and Carlos look like brothers. But when I say Anthony's my brother, it's so funny because we're, we're, what threw me off was we are 10 years apart. He was born in 1973. I was born in 83. I don't care. You guys know. Do the math. You know. But I want you to know, man, I love you. I think sometimes when we have high level discussions, we're, we get like, I know how much you care about me and that you're willing to push me to be better. You don't do it to be mean or anything. You do it because you know you see me better in me as a brother. And I need that. We all need that. Pastor does that to you guys. Sometimes y'all see it as him just pushing you down. Or why is he so mean? Why is he... Why is he always telling us to clean? Why is he always telling us to vacuum? 
Pastor Anthony has a beautiful gift of seeing things in people. And he says, you know what? That can go higher. You didn't give up on me. If you wanted to. <laughs> but we both got, stood up and said, we don't give up on God. You're my brother, but I will always honor you as a pastor of this house. Pastor Anthony. Amen. God is good, amen. 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 It is an honor to serve with these men. You know, God chose them. You know, as we started this, God started this ministry. Sorry, my brother always has to talk about something. It gets me emotional. I don't like crying because it makes me look weak. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I got to look mean still, you know. <laughs> Amen. But it is an honor to be in this house. I was here yesterday, and uh, the enemy kept on attacking me yesterday with in my mind. If, you know, it was actually just me and Sister Connie here taking care of the place. Enemy's like, you want to do another six years? This is what you're going to be doing all by yourselves. Maintaining this place, making sure all the bills are paid. Do you want to do it again? Started getting bitter. It's like, no, I don't want to do it again. But I had to go before the Lord and ask him to forgive me because I'll do it until he comes. Yeah. You know, there's a sacrifice that the men here have to take as pastors. The pastor's wives have to take a sacrifice as well. It's not easy for them to go through what we have to go through. Because when you target us, you target our wives. Keep our families in favor, in, in prayer. Men, I honor you guys for what you stood with us. Yeah. Lewis, Chris, Michael, and Pastor Jeremy. It's not easy. And Marissa, wherever she's at, she's somewhere around. She's been a part of this house as well. You know, but I said, Lord, forgive me, because I will do whatever you take take me to and I will never talk about this house and get upset frustrated maybe but that just part of life you know. but it is an honor to say we're going to go another year with this and just keep going until God tells us you know and I love everybody in this house and I honor you for all that have partaken into this house and boys love you guys and I always say the boys, not because they're from Texas, but because they're from Texas, number one. <laughs> Amen. But I love you guys. You guys just came right in. And I honor you. Everybody that's come into this house since you started working. You know, I can go through the whole list. But the number one, you know, our prayer team who sacrifices so much. You don't understand what they have to go through. You really don't because you're not in there. But when you go and be part of that prayer team, attack after attack, that's because that's what they're doing. They're doing it for this house and for your family. Ashley, Veronica, keep doing it. I, I, she'll call me. I've been attacked. Well, that's just part of what we do. When we attack Satan in prayer, he's going to attack back. That's just the nature of things. The devil wouldn't be the devil if he didn't attack us because he, even him has to answer to someone. The demons have to answer to someone for not attacking us. But I want to thank you guys. It's been a tremendous six years. You know, we're going into camp. And I said no from the beginning. Nope. Didn't want to do it. And here we are again coming in to fire the mountain. <laughs> Marissa will choke her. She, every time she goes, this is how much it is. I'm like, Marissa, quit reminding me how much it costs. I go, we know. So yeah, she gives us those dates. But that's just a reminder of what God is going to do at fire the mountain. You know, we want everybody to be a part of this place. It breaks us when you're not there. Or you say, I'm not going to go. I got something else to do. You know, we wanted you to be a part of this house. Everybody, I honor everybody from the ushers. You know, because that's where I started. You know, I started cleaning this place. You know, that's just how I served. And I wasn't asking for anything. Another one I want to honor, Herman, man. That guy's not because he works for me, but he just, he's a great warrior in his house. He's tremendous. And I'm looking at, let's honor Brother Herman. Amen. Yeah. Great man of God, you know, 
And why do I pick certain out? Because those are the ones that stand out to me. Because those are the ones I can just tell them to do it. They won't even question it. They just do it. If I tell them to go clean, he's like, yes, sir. Even though I'm not older than you, you're older than me. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Amen. It doesn't matter. Amen. Amen. He's only 60? No? <laughs> just, I'm just kidding. But I love you guys, and thank you for being with us. My family who stood with me, all the times we had to, you know, not be able to do things that we wanted to do because we had to sacrifice. And I thank you. My wife, my children that have had a sacrifice since we started this place. Jeremy's children that have to, t- you know, sacrifice too where they can't see dad. You know, we, you know, we have to sacrifice somewhere, especially in the growth. But things are going to get better for us. You know, I, w- I shared with Pastor Jeremy and Shane. I told Shane, I go, there's a building that's available. I go, do what you got to do. You know, it's huge. It's, goodness, it's probably about 50 times the size of this place. And probably people are saying, you're out of your mind. Yes, I am out of my mind. But I've seen the vision of what God could do in that place. I've seen it. It's not that far from here. And the numbers might be outrageous. But I serve an outrageous God. And I got one of the best men to negotiate it. That's Shane right there, bro. Go for it, man. Just do what you got to do to try to negotiate that deal. And if God still has us here, he still has us here. But I honor everybody, and I thank you. You know, Sister Connie, thank you so much. I was thinking about you when I saw that building. I was like, oh, dear God, that's a lot of restrooms. Because it's huge. You know, there's 15 women's stalls. I'm like, oh, my goodness, it's a lot. But we keep looking, you know, and I thank you, Sister Connie, for standing strong. You know, your husband stood strong, and I still see that characteristic in you to stand strong. And we love you. And I know that it's going to be a rough, I believe, next week because that would have been your anniversary. And you still have that anniversary because he's still with you. And we love him. And we honor him. And we thank you guys. God bless you all. I just want to thank all y'all for being here. Um, I just saw this. I just when they turn the lights, I just like like welcome you for the first time here. Thank you so much. Uh, what's your name? Marcus, Gianna. Thank you for thank you. I just random day for you guys to be on today. Thank you guys for celebrating with us. If I can get the pastors, if we're gonna join together. We're gonna close out in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another year, a new season, a new year, God, into your glory. We ask you, God, be with us. Give us strength, grace, and courage to keep moving forward, God. Never enter, never never tired, never weary, God. We ask you, God, take us forward, never back. Always forward, never backwards. Father God, take us to your promises for we will stay in your presence for as long as it takes. We will wrestle until you release your spirit, until you pour out your spirit, God. We will contend until you pour it out. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.